Hello culture fans and welcome back to the latest instalment of the Culture Books Club podcast. Uh, we are doing chapter three of Consider Phlebas, Clear Air Turbulence. My name is John and I'm joined in the pod by... Sheridan! Hello Sheridan, how are you tonight? I'm good. And so can I just, before we start, mm-hmm. they're naming the chapters after the ships, right? Not always. Ah. First chapter was just the planet. So, they're naming the chapters after the settings so far. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, clear air turbulence. Bit of a spoiler there. We haven't got to, we've got to that. And <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, and, and there's quite a lot of you who have been um, really enthusiastically downloading this podcast um, as, as each episode becomes available. And um, we're hoping you can just hang on. The pace is going to be roughly one a week. Uh, for various reasons involving us having lives and also letting, you know, you folks have lives too. Uh, okay, Sheridan, so... Um, Catch us up on the story so far. you got 30 seconds. Okay, so there's a war in space, but it's not a star war. Uh, and um, there's a mind of a civilization called the Culture and it's trapped on a planet of the dead called Shah's World. And there's a shapeshifter called Horza who's working for the other side in the war called the Adirans. And um, he's been sent to get them and he's been, uh, there's been a battle in space and Horza has been cut loose um, in his spacesuit into the galaxy. And bing, bing, bing. There we go. God, was that 30 seconds? Yes. I don't think I can do the chapter in the same amount of time. <laughs> oh, you better try. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's um, roughly uh, where we're up to. So Hawes is in a spacesuit, having had his ship blown out from under him. Have, I mean, he's had a rough day. He was rescued from a sewer cell as he was about to drown. Yeah. And, um, you know, and he keeps having to talk to this Balveda woman. Um, he seemed to get a bit of a rest, though, on the Idirian. Did he? I mean, he got time to have a shower and eat yeah, some food. And a then, little rest. And then he was literally thrown out into space um, and uh, as his ship got blown up around him. And uh, now something is coming closer. Um, and, and so now we hit what's happening in this chapter. Sheridan, can you recap us in 30 seconds? Okay, so Horza has been thrown out into space. And he's been... he Something comes for him and it knocks him out. And then he wakes up naked on a table. And they're talking Moraine, which is the culture language. And they think he's dead. And then he realises there's mercenaries. And um, he basically asks him for a chance to survive. And so then he gets into a fight with a long-armed man called Salon and he meets the little hottie called Yalzon, who seems to have a better voice than a body. Um, and, uh... All right, finish up. Um, and so he, he wins the fight and demonstrates a little bit of mercy because he tries to save Salon. But the leader of the mercenaries, whose name is escaping me... Cracklin? I think, yes, correct, yes. Um, basically says if you don't kill him, you'll be dead. And so he, even though he has mercy, mercy he's obviously not an idiot. So Horza does um, snap his neck. And then um, they dump Salon's body. And it seems like it ends with Horza being a bit of a space playboy because he's clearly macking on to Yalzin. He's he's macking onto Yalson, or Yalson is macking onto. They're him? both macking onto each other. Mm, I, we're going to explore this. It a seems bit. consensual at this point. Now, one thing I quite liked about the start of this chapter is describing Hawes are trying to figure out how to make the suit work, as something's coming in, and considering this was written in the nineteen eighties, it really. Um, was pre-recognising where we'd be right now with speech recognition on all the devices in our homes. Oh, yeah, that you can't shut them up and they just keep trying to talk to you. Yeah, and you're like, oh, how do I tell it to do the thing I want it to do? And, uh, I mean, this is this is really good prediction. Um, for I believe he actually wrote most of it in 1982 and they got published in 87. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely we all knew that speech recognition would give us trouble, but it, it, it's really, you know, what is it, um, nearly 40 years later has just, Hit the point we're at, so... That's um, a good observation. Yeah. Uh, bonus points, Mr. Banks. So, uh, and that, so it's describing a bit of, you know, action. This ship is coming closer to him, um, and he doesn't know what it is, and um, that's all nicely suspenseful. 
and then he gets hit by um, an effector. He does get hit by an effector. And so a lot of things come out of this because the effector clearly is meant to kill any living thing. Uh, let, let's just backtrack a little bit. What did you take from this chapter that an effector was? Oh, just some sort of machine that kills people. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, the way it was used, because I mean, and they go on and on a bit in this chapter and, and furthermore about how the bow laser on the clear air turbulence is broken and the owners of the ship need to replace its main weapon, which is the bow laser. Um, but so instead they're using the effector, which is... Again, it's, it's really incredible precognition in 1982 because we're just starting to develop weapons like it um, in, in the world today, um, which is basically uh, any modern fighter plane or warship with a synthetic aperture radar, it doesn't just bounce radar beams out and, and collect the signals. It can also have an effect on electronic systems um, at a distance. Oh, so was it meant to, like, shut down the system in his suit so he suffocated? Yeah. But yeah. he doesn't. I mean, it might have worked, but well, maybe the, it's a changer characteristic. The fact he survived is probably part of his changer characteristics. Because yeah. they were definitely... Because effectors in the culture can also affect human brains as just another piece of machinery. Um, but, it, yeah, in this case, they definitely did want... It, the, a, the people using it don't know how to use it that well. and Because it's pretty clear through this chapter that... We're dealing with roughly the equivalent of Somali pirates. You know, they're all in raggedy shorts and t-shirts and bits of space suits. I did like their shorts um, and t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it certainly gives you a sense that you're not dealing with professionals. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 that, that, that comes across really well. Um, and, uh, and, and But uh, we're going to meet a lot more use of effectors in, in, in these books. And what's really cool is that he must have been talking to people back in the 80s about what they were trying to do with these new synthetic aperture radars because literally, as of, you know, five, six years ago in the war over Syria, they were starting to use um, fighter planes with these radars to melt circuit boards of uh, roadside bombs, um, which is getting to what he's describing with the, with these things. Uh, anyway, so that's a little bit of um, Ian Banks' uh, weapons prediction. Um, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I guess it's kind of been obvious, but they do describe the war with the culture as being a holy war. So it is ooh, now... Sorry, who describes that? Horsa does. Mm -hmm. So that he's employed by the Idurans in their holy war against the ho culture. Actually, no, it's not Horsa. It's the, just the narrator. Mm. Um, who's, you know, on unknown third person, yeah. um, or not even person, just, um, narrator. Mm. Um, anyway, it's kind of obvious, a little bit obvious from the first couple of chapters that it is an ideological war, but that now makes it exceedingly clear to me. Okay. Which is kind of interesting because, like, you know, we talked about that there's not a lot of information about what the war's about and why they're fighting. Uh, in terms of, yeah, getting to the reasons for mm. the war. Yeah, that, I agree. It, it progresses that slightly, although, you know, we have got the idea that the culture are essentially atheist and dominated by artificial intelligences and the Adherans are highly religious. Um, you know, we, we had covered that before, but yeah, okay. Um, that's interesting. And then we get a long period of um, blacked out dialogue, which um, would have been fun in if, you know, the movie of this book had ever been made. Well, it's kind of fun when you do the audio book. Yeah, right. <laughs> they do them in a sort of Cockney accent. Oh, to indicate lower classes. I think so. That's yeah. a bit disappointing. I was a little bit actually. sus that one of them might have been Australian, or I, Co I did think maybe New Zealander, but that mm. might have been my own cultural mm. bias. <laughs> Cockney and Australian are, are, are quite similar. Now, I'm going to throw something at you. I think this whole chapter is an allegory for patriarchal capitalism. Oh, wow. Why is that? Because she goes off and bets on him, and not just that. Uh, we, okay, well, you know, as we progress through what we're discussing, I'll, I'll 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 bring up the quotes as we get to it. So he wakes up in the hangar of a ship, and we what well, this ship, the clear air turbulence, is kind of the Millennium Falcon of, of this story, isn't it? 
Uh, I guess you don't know that, but I know that. Sorry. Uh, in that, you know, it, it can get about from A to B and it's... It doesn't seem very sophisticated from even my yeah, reading of the it, chapter. It's got a, it's, it's got... It's got a few, you know, it's ringity dink. It, it is an, a Hirondon assault ship. Mm. Mm. Um... So you got Horza waking up, and um, the reason, the big reason I keep thinking this is actually an allegory for patriarchal capitalism is Craiklin has a name, who's the leader of the Free Company, which is just a word for a gang of mercenaries, mm-hmm. uh, slash pirates, slash looters, slash, we're, we're talking scavengers on the end of civilized, civilization here, uh, keeps getting referred to as the man as well as Craiklin. That's true, yes. Yes. So I think that's our first hint. Um, and, you know, then we get introduced to Zalon, who, it, it sounds kind of cool. I mean, he's, he's very silver youthful. Hair, he, but he's silver-haired youth. Yeah, silver But be- then I was like, is that like that phase, you know, how, like, young girls just started dyeing their hair grey? Or so, young women, I should say. Yep. Um... There is a description of the hair being so silver that it was reflecting lights, though. So we're not it just seems talking... seems to be cool, yeah. We're not just talking grey. We're talking, you know, jazzy, um, you know, cyberpunk hair here. And he has and non-retractable genitals. Which, you know, it's what we most of us live with. Uh, yeah, so Horsa kicks him in the nuts. And long arms. Um, yeah. Um, and, and you have this, this... This is where I think it's an allegory for patriarchal capitalism because Horsa starts pleading... You know, so at least give me a chance. Your mercenaries, uh, let me join. All I'm asking for a chance. Uh, and the captain was like, no, nah, we've only got room for uh, oh, one, see, yeah, one right. in, one out. Um, you know, the, the, there's scarcity here. And right. yeah, I, I, I think that's a part of... Where's the patriarchal element? Uh, the man. I mean, Cracklin is the man. And we're going to get to the key quote um, in a sec. Um you know, but also there's the issue that Horza looks old because he had been... Um, oh, so he's useless, so you've got to get rid of him because he's no longer got any production left in him. Yeah, uh, but also you've got this whole tension through the fight that Horza's like, oh, if only I had the body that I I think I have if that I'm used to. If I was a old young male, I'd have worth in this system, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but also, you know, in the fight he's fighting against the limitations of the elderly body he's changed himself into. Um, you know, when he's fighting this, um, you know, fighting to the death against this fit young guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, it, also there's the whole thing about, you know, if Horser only had his, you know, poisonous teeth and... Um, I found actually him continually forgetting that he doesn't have his poisonous teeth very irritating mm. because I feel as though if I had poisonous teeth and someone took them away from me, I would remember that. How much remembering do you do in the middle of a fight to the death? I think if I was in a, if I had like poisonous teeth and mm. I didn't have them anymore, I probably would make some different decisions. Mm. But he probably would have died if he hadn't bitten um, Zalan anyway. Sure. Well, Zalan just slips in his own blood though. Yeah. yeah, but the blood is there because of the bite. But yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and we are told that the character we're going to be met. As Yelson has a nice voice, because at the start it's all just the audio of what he's overhearing. Mm. He's um, a little bit do- disappointed when he when he finds out she's a hairy troll. Why are you disappointed? No, he is. Is he? Yes, he says literally he was a little disappointed. Oh, okay. I, see, there you go. This is why you're here because I didn't. So, you I know, didn't get that bit. He's the man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. All me- all male members of the patriarchy go along for the ride. Yeah. And there is, I mean, they introduce this thing, which is a, you know, conceit of the story that he's terrified about them realizing he's a changer, which limits, cause he, you know, he's trying to say, Hey, I can be really useful to you. Uh, but he doesn't want to be cause I'm a changer. Um, because it he... seems like the changes are very, people are very scared of them. Well, wouldn't you be? There's, well, I don't know. A... They've got hairy trolls and yeah, but these Big people out there who can, who can silver-haired, long-armed men, like I don't know what the hierarchy is, but yeah, the, but if the someone changes. if someone can replicate you and replace you, that's scary. Well, I mean, this is maybe where your allegory does come in because there's oh, that yeah. whole section about the reason people are scared of the changes is mm. because they take away from individualism, mm-hmm. which is a trait that humans value exceeding like very highly. Yeah. 
Um, but Horza, you know, he, he lets Yeltsin know his name and then he's like, oh no, why have I done that? Um, which, you know, it's, I mean, literally, you know, True. idiot, tell them your real name, that's it. Why not tell them you're a changer as well, fool? Um, anyway, the, the, he, now here's a bit I want your take on in particular. Um, so Yeltsin, um, gives him a pair of shorts and, uh, makes sure he's ready for the fight to the death that's been set up between Horza and Zalan in the, in the hangar of Clear Air Turbulence. Her hand was dry and cool and strong. She squeezed his. She let go before he had time to squeeze back. He had no idea where she came from, so he didn't read too much into it. Where he came from, that would have been a fairly specific sort of invitation. Well, yeah, obviously in his culture, it's like, you know, like, that, that's like the human, like, the, or the, our human equivalent mm. of, like, if you get your middle finger and, like, touch the inside of someone's palm. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, I, I get that, but I, I'm just wondering if there isn't some sort of foreshadowing here that I'm, I'm not picking up, but it's been very deliberately written to give you the idea that he's like, was she coming on to me there? They're totally coming on to each other the whole chapter. Okay. All right. Um, well, you, look, I mean, maybe you get that more in the audio book because <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, breathy sort of dialogue going on. Hmm. Okay, now, that line you were talking about uh, has just come up um, as we move forward through the chapter. A changer was a threat to anybody who ruled by force, either of will or of arms. Uh, it was a challenge to the individualism. Uh, so, yeah, you're on there. Now, the fight scene goes on for quite a while. It does go on. It's quite a, it's quite a you know, tense scene. I was, you know, it's a bit page-turning. I found myself skipping ahead in the paragraphs and going back to... Yeah, the, see what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's a very taut action scene, um, and you get to this moment where Zalan's got the wood on uh, Horza, and this is why I think it's an allegory for patriarchal capitalism. Uh, Horza thinks maybe the man will take pity. He must have seen I fought well. I was just unlucky. Maybe he'll stop it. Yeah, Horza's hoping that the man is going to recognize his worth and reward him. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of the, the little rat race treadmill that we're all on in this, um, you know, patriarchal capitalist, uh, society. Won't they please appreciate me? There uh, is also too that, um, when Zalan enters the fight, I don't think he realizes how expendable he is hmm. because, um, Yalson says he's only letting him fight because... He doesn't he, care. He doesn't care. Mm. Um, and he thinks he's the weakest link. But Zalan, you know, like a good little worker bee, mm. is just going in there thinking he's not at risk, but he's in extreme risk when he makes that decision. Well, he's also probably looking at this withered old He definitely is. But, I mean, the guy kicked him in the nuts and got mm. the jump on him once already, and the fool yeah. comes back for another go. Yeah. Uh, now, there is a bit here where we've had this sense that Horza has astonishing luck, and I think the way the fight ends is also touching on the, the, the crazy luck of Horza, uh, because Zalan's got him pinned down, and his fist has come back, and he's about to smash him, and, you know, Horza knows that this is going to be the end, you know, he's describing it as the um, guillotine blade, and then he just slips on the blood that's on the, the hangar floor and um, falls over, and that, that lets Horza... Uh, get on top of him and get him in a headlock. Uh, and I think that's part of the luck where that, you know, Horza's strange luck that we might get to the causes of later comes in. When it has already been alluded, well, not even alluded to, Scuffed. stated. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but Horza's in no way, in no way in control of that. He thought he was going to die. Um... And, and then we've, so we've got Kraiklin, um, the man, the captain of the ship, and Horser is pleading with him saying, don't make me kill this guy, which counts very nicely to Horser's character, mm. I think. Um, I don't know, would, would, would you have given this guy who's just punched the crap out of you that opportunity? No. I mean, Horser seems like a pretty cool dude. He's a pretty nice guy. You know, if I was Yalzen, I'd probably want a bit of that too. <laughs> Well, it depends what else, what other talents on the ship, I guess. Uh, and and this line from Craiglin that I've no place on the ship for somebody who hasn't the taste for a little murder now and again. Yeah. 
Uh, again, I, I think this is laying it on thick with this is patriarchal capitalism. You've got to be willing to kill each other. Oh, you've got to be willing to climb to the top and... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. I just want to know where the, fe- where, where the um, feminist, cap- feminist capitalist society exists because I think all capitalism is patriarchal, but... Uh, I think women are entirely capable. A woman could have been Franklin. Um, but that doesn't take away from it being a patriarchal capitalist system. You yeah, can well, have... No one's written that yet that I'm aware of, but it, it's it's theoretically possible. One thing that is coming out of this is there... I mean, there's definitely... He didn't foresee the um, Western uh, discussion about gender and it being non-binary. There's a lot of binary discussion about men and women. There's a line in there that said, they all appear to be human... I'm not quoting, but it's worse mm. to the effect of... They all appear to be human, both men and women. Okay. And there does seem to be a, you, you know, in, in his writing, hmm. characters are very clearly placed in a male, female gender role. I mean, I find that an interesting observation because as we get moved through these books, we're going to hit something that's extremely progressive for its time in terms of um, gender and society. Well, in don't books. tell me. Don't spoil it. No. Don't know why I spoil it. Sure. Uh, anyway, so what did you think of um, Yeltsin and uh, Hawes' interaction uh, after the fight? Well, I mean, she's pretty happy. She's won some money. Well, she, but she chose to bet on him. She did, yes. Yes, and she, all she was seeing was this old dude who'd been knocked out by an effector. And, um, yeah, decide. but clearly when he gets zal- zalin in the nuts, people mm. must... A, a smart person mm. would be going... Something going on here. Mm. Well, he does have a fight. And, and he does say, I mean, he tells them he's taken a drug mm. that makes him change his appearance. Mm-hmm. So maybe she's like, mm, there's something there. This guy's not what he seems. I wonder about that description of her handshake right at the start. To what extent she's actually clocked him and understands his society. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think she thinks he, I think she suspects he's a changer. Yeah, or something. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we get introduced to the, um, the Bratisilicans. Yeah. I don't know what to make of these clones. Yeah, a group of three, a clone group that's paranoid. Uh, and apparently this is rare because, you know, Yeltsin says, we must be the only free company with a clone group that's paranoid. Um, and then they're like, don't listen to her. <laughs> we want to be your friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then they dump, um, Zalon's body, which it's quite sad. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's the final description here. Um, how the, the, the ship, just before it goes into the warp, um, where it had found a live man in a suit, it left a dead youth in shorts and a tattered shirt, tumbling and freezing while a thin shell of air molecules expanded around the body like an image of departing life. Yeah. Yeah. I think your allegory might be right. Mm, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, what are your thoughts as the um, first-time reader on where we've got up to in this paragraph and where we're going? Well, clearly he's moved away. He's not going to Shah's world anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So I feel like the narrative's taking a bit of a deviation from the main goal. Side quest going on. Side quest, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um... So, yeah, I'm interested to see where that goes. Mm. Um, I'm kind of interested to find out more about these mercenaries. Mm. They sound interesting and how they fit into the whole society. What I find really cool about this is that I've got a clear image in my head analogous to Somali pirates. And yet this book was written decades before Somali pirates. But pirates have existed for a long time. They have, but this idea that people on the, on the you know, the far excluded edges of society just trying to get something back out of the... But that's what pirates have always been. Yeah. Okay. Well, they've varied over the years. I mean, they've always been people trying to get some money out of the global commerce, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, well, this has been... We were a little longer than I thought we would for quite a short chapter. Any other bits you want to discuss from this one? I think I'm good. I think I've covered it all. It was an exciting, action-filled chapter. 
Yeah, well, you know, Kinetic is the E&M Banks brand. Uh, <laughs> all right, folks, uh, we will be back, we promise, within seven days. And um, hope you enjoyed this one. And, of course, do follow us on the um, the Facebooks and the, uh, the Twitters and uh, all the stuff's on the website page to find us. And uh, let us know what you think. We'll uh, be back soon. Bye. Bye.